Um, okay, uh, I will go ahead and get going. So I'm Jeff G on Noster. Um, I've been working full time in Noster for a little over a year now. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about a couple of the characteristics that make Noster really special over a lot of other attempts that have been uh, made at decentralized social media and decentralized publishing in general. So first, um, just in case you've been living under a rock or trading altcoins for the last two years or so, I'm going to do a very quick kind of run through of what Noster is. Um, Noster stands for Notes and Other Stuff Transmitted by Relay, which is a little bit abstract. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, I tried to come up with a slightly better one, a uh, simple transport protocol using Bitcoin cryptography primitives. That's kind of a mouthful. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, but I think it's a little bit more accurate in terms of what it actually does. Um, because at its core, Noster is just a method for communicating information. And importantly, it's a rug resistant way of communicating information. Um, like TCP IP or some of the early internet protocols, the best way I think to think about Noster is just that it is allowing you to move information around the internet between different parties in a way that is secure and in a way that is uh, decentralized and distributed. Most people coming into Noster now, um, I think uh, maybe less this group, but I think the first time most people see Noster, the first thing they think of is, oh, it's just a Twitter replacement. And I suppose when you flip back and forth between these two, you can kind of understand that misconception. Um, but Noster is not just about uh, social media. And I think that's a really, really important piece of this. When I first saw Noster, this is actually what I saw. Um, this is a visualization of what the entire internet looked like in about 2003. Um, and you can see that over the course of almost 20 years, that graph grew incredibly dense and much larger. Um, but fundamentally, that is the thing that sort of really caught my attention and got me really excited about Noster. It was this idea that we had potentially a chance to rebuild the internet back into what it was in the kind of late 90s, early 2000s, which was very odd, very uh, decentralized. It was There was no major gatekeepers. A lot of services sort of worked. Um, and I think that was a much better model of what we want the internet to be for most people. So when you come back to this sort of long description, um, you know, we'll talk about, you know, I'll break out a couple of the things out of this list that I think are really important and we'll, we'll go through them. So the three things that I think Noster, that makes Noster really unique is this portability, interoperability, and the openness of the whole protocol. So when you think about Noster being portable, what I mean by that is that um, your Noster keys are your identity. Um, those go with you as long as you keep them safe. And that means your identity across the entire internet, the entire Noster internet, is the same thing. Uh, you sign into a different client, you have all of your data, all of your social graph, everything that comes with you. You sign into another new client, it's the same stuff. Whether that's a social client or whether that's a client that is helping you, you know, do AI or whether it's a client that it's a word processor or a team collaboration app, it's all the same uh, fundamental identity. And that's really important because it gives us sort of a single place to think about each person. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that they are KYC'd and known who they are. It's like Bitcoin, it's pseudonymous. Um, this is sort of the core of why uh, Noster is portable. This is the data format that is Noster. Um, it is based on an extremely simple uh, data format called JSON. Um, is JSON the most efficient and you know elegant format out there? No, absolutely not. Is it the simplest and the easiest to use? Probably. And so there's all sorts of trade-offs in Noster that I think on first blush, when a lot of Bitcoiners look at it, they kind of freak out about because they're like, oh, it needs to be faster. It needs to be better. It needs to use less data. It needs to do all these things. But it's actually not true. It needs to just be used by lots of people. And we'll figure that stuff out along the way. Another thing about portability is this relay model. Um, relays are, again, built to be extremely simple, very commodity, open source hardware. Um, they should be extremely cheap to run. And that gives you the ability to run lots and lots and lots of them very easily. And so we're just beginning to scratch the surface of what relays can do. But I believe that this is sort of where we're going. You know, you'll run private relays to ar archive your own data. You'll run relays for just your friends and family. You'll have smaller kind of semi-private groups. And then you'll have lots of larger public relays that are out there. Um, but it's really, really important that we do not allow this to centralize the way that AWS and other cloud services did. And so 
a lot of the focus now is sort of building the infrastructure and the tools to allow people to do this exact thing without too much trouble. Okay, so interoperable is um, one that I think uh, probably a bunch of you guys saw Millions talk earlier from Primal. Um, he covered a bunch of this stuff, and, and the interoperability piece is the one that a lot of people kind of realize very quickly is, is pretty magic. Um, you, if you don't like a client, you just switch, and it's not like you have to export your data and then import it and there's some process. You literally just sign out and sign into another one. Um, I'm generally signed into like four or five clients on my phone all the time. Um, and there's nothing I have to think about there. It's not like I'm going to break something by being in one or the other. And the way that Noster does this interoperability is because of this simple data format and this uh, field called kind, which just tells every client what the piece of data is. So a kind one is a short text note, like a tweet. Um, a kind 30,023 is a blog post. Um, there's all sorts of different kinds out there. Zaps are actually just another bit of data that looks like this with a different kind. Um, and so everything in Noster is more or less this with a couple of fields changed. And that makes it incredibly easy for clients to handle the data in a very similar way and then decide whether or not they actually want to handle that data, do something with it, or if they just want to ignore it. One of the best examples of this interoperability is Amethyst. Um, Vitor, the developer on Amethyst, loves to put everything into Amethyst like the day it comes out. So anybody suggests a new idea and he, like the next day it's in Amethyst for all of his users to use. Um, what you can see on the left here is actually marketplace listings. So he's got like a buy and sell Craigslist type board in the middle of the app. And then on the right, he's got a bunch of live streams from Zapstream that are showing up uh, again within the client. So again, it is a nice feature, but it's also a really core piece of like how does um, how does Noster stay uh, decentralized and open and spaced out? It's because all clients can, can ingest the same data and they know what the format's going to be ahead of time. And finally, um, openness. And I think, like, again, this is foundational. And really, it kind of stems out of the first two. Um, you know, you've got this open network where anybody can participate, anybody can come in. There's no, like, formal process to creating a new kind number. If you write a client and you just start using a, num a new number, as long as no one else is using it, it's pretty much fine. Um, if you want other people to use it, you need to spec it out and put it in the, you know, in the spec. But there's really very few rules in how people use Noster. And I think that openness is what is going to hopefully save the internet for us. Um, I don't know how many people are familiar with Ben Thompson's aggregator theory, um, but it is, I think, a really good way to understand what happened with the internet and how we kind of went wrong. Um, Pre-internet, the hardest piece of the puzzle for people trying to get you know, content out there was actually the distribution aspect. So you ended up with these companies that would you know, vertically integrate, they'd have writers, like newspapers and books and magazines, they'd have the writers, they'd send them out, they'd get the photos, they'd produce the content, and then they would have the connection to the customers that they could then distribute to. The internet broke that completely, and what more or less happened is that in the span of, you know, a little over 20 years, we turned um, what was kind of a Wild West uh, publishing platform where anybody could publish anything into more or less a toll booth controlled by a very small number of very, very large companies. And because of this portability and interoperability, you are sort of given openness almost for free. As long as we don't allow things like relays to drop into, you know, okay, there's only three or four gigantic relays that everybody uses, um, you're almost guaranteed to keep a large degree of openness in a system like this. You don't have the ability to sort of put the data behind a wall and say, nope, you can't access this unless you come and pay me. Um, you know, people keep asking, why don't we have a you know, Twitter to Noster cross-posting tool yet. And it's because Twitter's API is closed and it costs a shitload of money. And so all the devs look at it and they go, the, the, obviously we should do that. But then you look at it and you're like, nope, not possible. Or I'm not going to pay for it. Um, so it doesn't happen. Okay, so those are kind of the three major things that I kind of set out to talk to uh, everybody about in this talk. Um, but I went on a walk two days ago with the Sovereign Engineering Group that uh, Pablo and Gigi have been running for the last two months here. And... A bunch of the conversations that we had on that made me think about this in a slightly different way. And I want to give you guys a little bit of a peek on that. So Nostra is actually going to succeed because it mimics nature. And I know that sounds kind of over the top or maybe a bit uh, hyperbolic, but stick with me for just a second. Nature functions on a very small number of fixed rules. Things like gravity and electromagnetism, things like that, right? 
It's like not that many rule, foundational rules of nature. But based on those very small number of fixed rules, we get an incredible diversity and complexity of things. Um, you know, mycelial networks are absolutely incredible and we understand maybe 2% of actually how they function. The way I'm speaking to you right now is an incredibly complex structure that is really insane when you look at it. And I mean, even evolution is just this process of a small set of simple rules iterated over thousands and thousands and millions and billions and trillions of times over a long period of time. It's this really wide net where the feedback loops are allowed to happen and the feedback is actually acted upon rather than, you know, squashed down. Bitcoin also functions on a small number of very fixed rules. We have 21 million. We have it's a valid transaction or it's not a valid transaction. And because of that, you and then because of an open network around it, you end up with lots of emergent behaviors that weren't necessarily predictable by the protocol to start with. Things like, you know, coin joins or things like gas flare mining. Um, you know, we have sort of accidentally discovered an amazing way to fix climate change uh, using Bitcoin. Um, and I don't think that necessarily would have been obvious at the start. I think you know where this is going. Noster as well functions on a very, very small set of fixed rules. In fact, the only required NIP is NIP number one, and that's the one that describes the structure of the data and how to talk to a relay. That's literally it. Everything else is optional. And so, again, we're so early in the days of what inner, you know, what Noster might become. Um, but I think by sticking to something extremely simple, extremely easy for people to experiment and play with, we are giving it a really great chance to develop into something really incredible, really diverse, and probably way more complicated and complex than we would otherwise think it might be able to, to do now. And I'll just leave you with this quote, uh, Gaul's Law, that I love. And I think th like this quote alone sort of sums up why all of the other protocols and all the other decentralized social things that are out there um, have no appeal to me whatsoever. They all start kind of from the opposite direction of let's try to be prescriptive with high complexity on how to solve a really hard problem. And if we're prescriptive enough and we think about it long enough, we'll be able to give you the exact correct solution at the very beginning. And I just don't think that's ever possible. And so uh, John Gall agreed with me, and I think uh, that's where I'll leave it. Thanks. <laughs>